We're giving thanks to God today for three people, two Germans, Johann Sebastian Bach and George Frederick Handel, and one Englishman, Henry Purcell. George Frederick Handel became a British citizen in the mid-1600s, in essence adopting England as his adult country from their writing Handel's Messiah. We give thanks for the three of them because they really do, in essence, create the foundation between their three works for what we know, quite honestly, as our legacy, especially of English church music. Um, people who freely, in all three cases, were free to adopt uh, scripture, to write in the vernacular as opposed to in Latin, and felt when they particularly wrote their Christian music, because especially Purcell was as at home in the theater as he was at the church organ, uh, felt that their responsibility as composers was to communicate biblical truth. That is what we have inherited. So what we don't get as much, especially in Handel and Purcell, are mass settings in Latin as much as we now get the communication of biblical stories and the communication of Christian truth through song. That, in fact, is in some ways the major transition in church music from the 15th to the 16th century. They lived in a world that was both similar and dissimilar from our own. Uh, they lived in a time of extor extraordinary both political and religious tumult the aftermath as well as the upheavals around the formation of the Reformation, uh, political enemies in all of the intrigue, especially in England, going from you know, king to queen to king to queen, uh, people who were in power in the very next were being taken to their version of Gitmo, which was the Tower of London, tortured, beheaded with their heads, poked on high sticks on the Bridge of London, you know, for all to see the price that male factors would pay. Heretics burned at the stake openly. It was grisly. And it was a very, very hard and difficult life. But the place where they were dissimilar to ours, and it's communicated so much in their music, was they had an extraordinary optimism in the midst of all of that kind of political and religious evil about the future. They had a deep inherent belief in the divine right of kings. They felt like God was in his throne. And even though we're living through these terrible times of difficulty, God is working out his purpose even though we may not be able to see it at the time. And therefore, their music communicated, the Christian music, that kind of profound faith in the sovereignty of God and the present power of God. Those are the very things that we are called to proclaim within the content of the 150th Psalm. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his excellent greatness. In other words, his good and loving omnipotence. Our world does not have that kind of sunny disposition. We feel like we live in a world that is in chaos, where the future is extraordinarily uncertain. And even all of the best kind of cheerleading about humans taking responsibility for their choices to make a difference in the world feels somewhat hollow in the face of the ever-changing landscape. How much change can an individual, in fact, actually create, especially if, quote unquote, the machine, however you define that, is against you? So it takes courage, I mean real courage, to be able to live with the kind of clarity that says, in the midst of a world that feels like chaos, in the midst of my own capacity, as limited as it might be, to be someone who reflects mercy and grace and justice and the things that God works in us, 
I will take that position. And especially if you're an artist, which is who we're praying for these days, to uh, allow that kind of grace and charity to flow through your works, whether they be visual art or music, in a way that actually encourages the people of God and speaks that word of encouragement, not just to the people of God, but to the world around it. That's what they saw as their responsibility. It's easy to do it if you're in Solomon's court and the glory of the Lord has come down in your midst so that you can't even stand for the sake of the presence of God. The temple is dedicated. Solomon is seen as God's regent to carry out the will of the Almighty. Of course, we're on a roll here, and we will praise God because we see his acts. It's something else again to offer this, that same praise with that same clarity in the midst of a congregation that doesn't always share that sense of vibrancy and hope, either at the personal level, much less, notice I would say, they would not, you see, much less at the national or international level. And yet that is in fact a part of what it means to be light of the world, salt of the earth. How does that happen unless we as individuals and as Christian communities begin to wrestle seriously with what does it mean to take Paul's admonition in Colossians to be rooted in him, in Christ Jesus. How do we do that? How do we live that out? Both in a corporate way that expresses through the kind of power of prayer, charity and servanthood that we express toward one another. Financial generosity in times of need the capacity to be able to move forward and touch a community with the love of Jesus. How can we live that out? And how do we as individuals orient our own devotional life, our relationships with other Christians, so that we actually get the nourishment and spiritual growth that we need to live with that kind of clarity? Because unless we do that, we will not have in our day the caliber of Christian artists that they had in their day. Instead, the artists of our day will only reflect the nihilism that is pervasive within the world. Go to any museum of modern art on the planet, and that's exactly what you see. Whether MoMA in New York or the Tate Modern in London or you fill in the bank, it is nihilism on a canvas. We don't say that. But it means creating the kind of environment within our churches that actually inspires a different vision that nurtures and raises up the vulnerable heart of the artist to speak with that kind of grace and courage and to not merely settle for what I call Jesus junk that merely passes his art but is only just another reflection of the debasement of our own popular culture. They did not settle for that, which is why we still sing Handel's Messiah, as well as all the other things that you could come to mind, in a way that won't have, our contemporary music will not have that kind of shelf life. It will be lucky to pass a generation. I would say to you that the caliber of the vision actually drives the caliber of the art. And if we want great art, great artists, that takes a great vision. And a vision that comes from being rooted in Christ in the face of the chaos we know only so well. May we be rooted deeply as a community and as individuals in Christ Jesus in a way that sets the artists free to communicate both to us as well as to the world a vision of God's greatness and his steadfast love. Amen. Amen.